Boldwood Presents The Woman in the Woods Written by J. A. Baker And read by Leslie Harcourt The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. There is always one moment in childhood when the door opens and lets the future in. Graham Greene A memory is a beautiful thing. It's almost a desire you miss. Gustav Flaubert Chapter One I was twelve years old when I died. Twelve years, six months and three days to be precise. Six years later I was reborn, released from prison, given a new identity, a new life. A fresh start, different outlook. I was a changed person, quite literally. New name, another version of me. Like a snake shedding its skin, I slithered away from my old life and started again, viewing the world through a different lens, allowing for a more balanced perspective. That was what they told me while I was inside. All those psychologists and behavioural therapists, the stream of doctors who probed and delved into my head, that I had to have a more balanced view of the world, focus on the future, not let the past dictate who I am, who I could be. That I had to embrace the positive aspects of my life and ignore those dark shadows that without invitation elbowed their way into my brain trampling over my recent achievements, leaving me feeling deflated and alone. I use the word achievements very loosely. Small steps would be a more appropriate phrase, better suited to who I was. I hadn't achieved anything worth speaking of. I'd existed within those four walls, stayed out of trouble, kept my head down and not drawn any negative attention to myself. That was enough while others around me ranted and seethed, thrashing about in their beds, biting and spitting, banging their heads against brick walls and screaming for hours on end, I had remained silent, letting it all unfold around me. I didn't have the energy to be badly behaved. Instead, I would lie there on my wafer-thin mattress night after night, eyes closed, counting down the days to freedom blotting out the anger and the frustration, the terror and the feelings of utter hopelessness that crowded my mind. I did blue skies and sunny days, of green meadows carpeted with daisies and buttercups, while horses cantered around nearby fields, their long, silken manes blowing gracefully in the soft, warm summer breeze. They helped me cope, those thoughts and imaginings. The carefully created animated existence I dreamed about night after night. Those picture-perfect visualizations helped me to stay connected to the outside world, to remember that there was a life beyond those brick walls. A life that at some point I would be able to join. And then one day it happened. I was told that I could leave, that I had met the requirements for settling back into the outside world. I was rehabilitated, a new person, an alternative me, a cleaner and happier version of the child I once was. I was ready to face civilization and move on from the past, recalibrated and no longer out of kilter with those around me, a new me, a better me. Heather Elizabeth Oswald disappeared, and Mary Campbell was let out of a young offenders institute having served her time for a heinous crime that sickened and appalled the nation and the world at large. I was free. I left Heather behind and emerged as Mary, the girl I was about to become. Except there were no cantering horses ready to greet me upon my release, no rolling meadows and fields of buttercups. I was placed in a small flat above a greasy chip shop that stank of stale fat the all-pervading smell permeating through the fabric of my clothes and clinging to the carpet and curtains. 
Tin cans rolled and clattered around damp alleyways in the wee small hours. Dogs barked continually. Drunks shouted and fought outside my bedroom window. It was hell and heaven all rolled up into one big, fat, sodden mess of a life. Everywhere filthy, noisy and confusing. But at least I was out. I had a new life. I could start again. Be whoever I wanted to be. Be the person I had always hoped I could be. That was over 40 years ago. And now, here I am. Still here. Still breathing. Still the same old me. The person I always was. Who I will continue to be until the day I die. Because for all the trite, acceptable words that professionals use to describe rehabilitated prisoners, people are what they are. Deep down, none of us ever really change. Chapter 2 The Writer A pulse takes hold in my throat. I swallow and run my fingers through my hair, trying to appear confident and unperturbed. He's there again, sitting at the back, features sculpted, complexion chalk white. Striking. That's how I would describe her if asked. A striking individual with poise and grace and an uncanny ability to unnerve me with her pale skin, piercing azure eyes and direct gaze. I blink, rub at my eyes, trying to make sure I'm not seeing things. She turns away, then faces me again. I shift in my seat and stare down at my roughly written notes, the words blurring and merging as my eyes mist over, a small amount of fear beginning to grip me. It's always the same. Anxiety coupled with excitement before I begin, which almost always dissipates once I start to speak. I do my best to ignore her presence and focus instead on the task in hand, as usual, there are empty seats that will fill once the time for my speech grows near. I prefer a larger audience. It comforts me, massages my ego. It tells me that people still like my stories, that they are prepared to take time out of their day to listen to my ramblings. I suppose I need their adulation. It props me up, keeps me going, keeps me writing. As pedestrian and inane as it sounds, it's true that without readers, writers are nothing. I like to picture the people who read my novels, sitting curled up with one of my books, devouring every word. Even as I'm writing the grisly details of a fictional murder, I want them to feel relaxed and captivated by my prose, bewitched by my words. Does that make me sound sad and rather shallow? Maybe that's because it's true. I live alone in a small cottage near the river, a house surrounded by trees and a tangle of overgrown shrubbery, and I crave the applause and praise of other people. I need them to fill the void in my life, the gaping hole that may never be filled. I'm a half-person, incomplete. A partially written story is what I am. Perhaps that's why I enjoy my career so much, telling my own stories full of mystery and intrigue to try and plug the abyss that is there in my own existence. The parts of me that my brain won't allow me to remember. The memories that are either dormant, refusing to reveal themselves, or gone forever, never to return, exploding out of my brain after a speed and almost my life. The rumble of voices has me staring up at the crowd, my prepared script a blur of swirling grey in my peripheral vision, the words swimming and distorting on the page. It's now a full house, 120 or so seats and each one taken. A sudden surge of people all eager to soak up my words of wisdom and read my books. Relief blossoms within me, unfurling like the petals of a newly formed flower as it embraces the early morning dew and half-light of the new dawn. I want to throw off the mantle of worry that is perched on my shoulders and lose myself in the milieu of the moment. And yet, there is an undefinable ambience about this place today. Something that is putting me on edge. 
as if an incident is about to happen, an unforgettable occurrence, something that will ruin the day and dent my fragile veneer of confidence. I shrug off that feeling and gaze out once again at the spread of people, my waiting audience, my readers. She's still there with her pale skin and unbending posture, her body rigid and straight as an arrow. Her expression is harder to see, now lost amid the sea of faces that await my speech. I feel easier, more able to focus on my script, knowing her penetrating stare isn't so visible, knowing her face is lost amongst the crowd. I'll be able to think clearly, push away the anxiety that is beginning to have me in its grip. Perhaps it's her presence that's doing it, making me nervous and discombobulated. Maybe she is the reason I'm expecting some sort of unwelcome event to happen. Seeing her once in a crowd is forgettable. Twice, noticeable. Three times, deeply unsettling. This is the fourth time and I'm feeling distinctly out of sorts, nervous and agitated. I unclench my jaw, rotate my shoulders to loosen my joints. Just a face, that's all she is. An avid reader, a fan. I squirm at the use of that word, fanatic. It conjures up images of somebody so consumed with an idea or a person that they will go to any length to get what they want. An extremist. A maniac. I don't want her to be a fan. I don't even want her to be a reader of my books. I just want her to stop attending my talks and to leave me alone. I have many readers who come... She isn't like them. She is indifferent unsmiling and unresponsive, a face in the crowd, a possible threat. The room suddenly takes on an air of expectancy, as if something monumental is about to occur. The walls, the bookshelves, the people, their faces, their minds, swollen with anticipation, and perhaps even a touch of fear. Outside, the town hall clock chimes 5 p.m., each peal of the bell in perfect synchronicity with the thud of my heart, each ring reverberating through my chest like stampeding cattle, crushing me, trampling my body underfoot, sucking every last bit of oxygen out of my lungs. I take a long, shaky breath, just because I can, to convince myself that I'm not dying, that I can breathe and function like a normal person, and I scan the crowd searching for a sympathetic face, somebody who will help me recalibrate myself. A pair of caring eyes, a half-smile, a tilt of the head to convey their compassion and show interest in what I'm about to say. They all help to soothe my nerves, rebalancing my mind, suppressing the root fear I have that something will go horribly wrong that I'll stumble over my words, lose my train of thought, that somebody will ask me a difficult question, one that I cannot answer, and then everyone will laugh at my ineptitude before gathering up their coats and bags and leaving in disgust. Nobody will ever buy any of my books again. I'll be a laughing stock, a failure. That has never happened, ever. But there is always a first time. And I don't want it to be now, while she is sitting watching me, scrutinizing my every move. A gentle-faced, friendly-looking lady sits at the front, her pale blue eyes brimming with kindness and expectation. I keep her in my sights, smile at her and grip my papers with clammy fingers. She wants me to succeed. They all do. That's what I tell myself as I clear my throat and stand up, ready to do my talk. I inhale deeply, in through my nose and out through my mouth, my lips curled into a small O shape, and I begin. It's over before it's begun. That's how it feels. I glance at the clock on the wall of the now almost empty library, 6 p.m. I've been speaking and answering questions for almost an hour, 
Only a few people remain, everyone else having left looking happy. A copy of... She is still here, however. Chalk White Woman. That is my new name for her. She is sitting watching me, only looking away to briefly stare outside at the impending storm clouds that hang in the sky, their grey bellies engorged with rain. Despite her frequent attendance at my talks, not once has she ever spoken to me or asked me to sign a book. She has asked no questions, never engaging with either me or anybody around her. She simply sits there, staring ahead, eyes full of ice, her expression austere and unyielding. I stand up, determined to ignore her, watching as the final few attendees leave. I refuse to acknowledge her presence or her apparent dislike of me, her body language screaming at me that her malice for me runs so deep it is practically subterranean. No words have ever passed between us, no interactions, verbal or otherwise. There is no reason that I can think of for her to act this way. And yet here she is again, watching me from under her lashes, her body unmoving. That is until she stands up and begins to walk towards me. My scalp tightens, ice prickling each hair follicle. I turn away and pretend to rearrange my already perfectly stacked pile of books, my fingers fluttering over the dust jackets, tracing a line over my name printed there on the cover. I. L. Lawrence. The sight of it still has the power to make me misty-eyed and awestruck. I'm lucky in so many ways. I would do well to remember that to stop dwelling on my fears and insecurities and focus on my successes. Having a hole in my memory has damaged me in more ways than anyone will ever know. Every now and again I think that perhaps they are coming back. The images of my past, fleeting thoughts and visions jarring with me, only for them to disappear as quickly as they arrived, leaving me feeling confused and out of kilter. A stranger in my own life. I hear the shuffle of her feet along the wooden flooring, can almost feel the heat of her body and smell the buttery aroma of her breath wafting close to my face. Except when she does eventually arrive, there is nothing, as if she isn't actually there at all. When I do pluck up the courage to look up, she is standing next to me, the corners of her mouth turned up into something closely resembling a smile barbed wire cutting at the soft flesh of my throat, my voice clipped and laced with foreboding. I swallow and soften my tone. I hope you enjoyed the chat and the readings. My voice is hoarse, no more than a whisper, fear rendering me almost silent. She nods but says nothing in return. Part of me wants to keep speaking to keep her here and find out what her motives are, work out what it is she wants from me. Another part of me would like to push her away, to tell her to stay the hell away from me and never attend any more of my talks, that she unnerves and scares me with her staring eyes and unfathomable, cold mannerisms. But I can't. So instead, I point to the small pile of books on the desk and give her a wide smile. Would you like to purchase a signed copy of my latest novel? They're available at a reduced price, cheaper than the local bookshop. My voice, a friendly whisper, belies my true feelings. I've learnt to put on an act, to mask my innermost fears and sentiments. After the accident, I had to learn how to be me again, whoever that person actually was. I'm still learning. Every day is a lesson. Alicia, the librarian, gazes at me from where she is standing on the other side of the room, her eyes full of curiosity, her expression one of bemusement before she turns away again and continues with her work. I rub at my neck, suddenly feeling clammy and feverish. A line of perspiration coats my brow and sits on my upper lip. I might... 
chalk white woman says, her face still pallid, her mouth now unsmiling. She has returned to her usual frosty demeanor and stands motionless watching me. My eyes stray to the clock on the wall. Soon the library will be closing. I need to leave here to make my excuses and get as far away from this woman as possible. Well, if you don't fancy buying one, you can always loan one from this library. They have copies in stock. I should be encouraging her to buy one from me, but need her to leave. I need her to leave more than I need the money, even though at the present time in my life every penny counts. She doesn't reply, those deep blue eyes never leaving my face, studying me, watching for a fissure in my veneer, waiting for me to crack. In my peripheral vision, I see her hand moving, her long, slim fingers pushing a slip of paper underneath the cover of the book. My skin suddenly feels icy, my face flashing hot and cold. The thick, pink scar that runs the length of my face and zigzags across my hairline flares and tingles, small sparks of anxiety sizzling at my flesh. Without saying another word, she moves away and walks towards the door. Alicia doesn't appear to notice as she passes, her head lowered while she tidies her desk. Chalk White Woman leaves without uttering another word or showing any gratitude, the door slamming behind her with a dull thunk. Still, Alicia keeps her head down, immersed in her work. Suddenly we're alone, just the two of us in the building, a hush taking hold, silence enveloping us. I watch chalk white woman's retreating figure through the glass panels of the door. Her slim body slowly disappears amongst the thinning crowds outside, distant and ghost-like. Only then do I open the book and retrieve the piece of paper she placed inside, my heart a heavy thud in my chest, my fingers clumsy with dread and anticipation. The walls close in. The floor falls away beneath me when I read the words written there, the print swimming and looping on the paper. I blink and try again, each word, each letter like a knife being pushed deep into my abdomen. I know who you really are. Six small words that have the capacity to render me incapable of moving or thinking rationally. I swallow and push a strand of hair out of my face. My body feels heavy and numb, my limbs wooden when I try to move. Beneath the words is a grainy monochrome picture of a young girl, her features blurred, the image too distant, too indistinct to see her face properly. Everything okay there? I thought I heard you say something. I was just about to lock up. I clear my throat and look up at Alicia into her dark, quizzical eyes. She is probably thinking of a dozen different ways to politely ask me to leave the premises. It's getting dark outside. Everybody else has left. She wants to go home. I'm willing to bet she has a loving partner, a nice clean house and a pet that sits by the door waiting on her return. Her partner will have cooked dinner. The table will be laid complete with serviettes and maybe even a lit candle between them. Everything set out on a crisp white tablecloth. I think of returning to my cot, manoeuvring my way through the towering trees that surround my property. I shiver at the sheer anonymity of it all. The darkness, the indescribable loneliness. Then I think of Whiskey, my wonderful canine companion and feel my heart swell with love. It's not all bad. I have somebody at home waiting for me at least. My trusty old dog. My best friend. My only friend. Yes, sorry, of course. I'm ready to leave now. Just need to collect my things. The piece of paper slips from between my fingers and flutters to the floor, its glaring whiteness incongruous against the dark wooden flooring. Oh, here, let me. 
We bend down at the same time, our heads colliding when we lean forwards to scoop it up. Sorry, I say, my exasperation and anxiety spilling out. My desperation for her to not see those words a palpable force between us. But it's too late. She picks it up and hands it over the sight of it in her palm sending a sickly sensation spearing across my gut, making me lightheaded and nauseated. The room takes on different dimensions. Pieces of broken glass collide and shatter in my head. I stare down at it, at the slightly crumpled piece of paper and blink repeatedly to clear my vision. I've got it wrong, become confused somehow. In Alicia's hand is a receipt. Not a note, no picture, no words. Just a small, nondescript receipt for a snack from the local cafe. My eyes burn with unshed tears. I swallow and try to act normally. I must have been mistaken and picked up the wrong piece of paper. Next to me, Alicia makes a slight moaning sound and rubs at the side of her head. I'm abruptly riddled with humiliation and doubt. It was definitely there, that note. The picture, those words, I saw them. I'm not going mad, am I? Without waiting to see if she is injured or upset or completely bewildered by my strange behaviour, I grab at my belongings, snatch up the receipt from her hand and make my way to the door, my feet barely touching the ground. The words I felt sure I saw written on the paper etched into my mind, forever embedded into my brain as if carved onto tablets of stone. I know who you really are. The heavy door swings closed behind me, the noise reverberating into the near stillness outside. I step over the threshold and head out into the gray. Chapter 3 Summer of 1976 it wasn't the heat that was getting to her, even though her shirt was sticking to her skin like cling film. It was the boredom. The days stretched on and on. Everything still, the landscape, the world in general in a lull, crops, lawns, flowering borders deprived of water for almost a month. Adults draped themselves over fences, chatting to neighbours, bemoaning the water bands their bodies listless and floppy in the unrelenting heat as they wiped at their brows and stared up at the azure sky, searching for clouds, praying for any amount of rain to break the dry spell that they had endured for what felt like an age. The pavement was hot beneath Heather's backside as she sat, watching the world go by, the concrete absorbing every drop of warmth, retaining it and firing it back out onto her already hot and sticky body. She didn't mind so much, not like the adults who droned on and on, their voices echoing into the hot, cloudless sky. Too bloody hot to think straight. When will it ever end? I see Kevin at number 36 has been washing his car again. No water shortages for him then, eh? Heather suppressed an eye roll at the sound of the chatter, rested her chin on her knees and allowed her mind to wander. They were all idiots anyway. She'd heard her mum and dad say that over and over again. Her family wasn't like the others in their street, all the gossip mongers and do-gooders. Nobody could tell her family what to do, especially her dad. He paid for his water and would use as much as he bloody well liked. That was what he would mutter when the neighbours' talk drifted his way. Fuck the government and fuck this drought. She heard that line a lot as well, mainly when he was drunk, stumbling home from the pub late at night when she was supposed to be tucked up in bed asleep, his voice a loud rumble in the kitchen below her bedroom as he paced the floor, opening cupboard doors, searching for more drink, and if he got lucky, some scraps of stale food. Heather would lie there, the thin sheet that was draped over her body, pitted with holes big enough to fit her fingers through, her limbs languid, her stomach growling and grumbling. Hunger. It was always there, an overactive gremlin that inhabited her belly for days on end. 
Images of roast dinners and apple pie and long, large glasses of lemonade filled her thoughts. And then she would fall into a fitful sleep, where dreams of the brightest colours flooded her brain, the flimsy threadbare curtains doing little to block out the early morning light that flooded her room, accentuating the peeling wallpaper, the mouldy ceiling and bare floorboards, the heat of the early morning sun heightening the smell of urine that rose from her bedsheets in unrelenting waves. She sighed and drummed her fingers on the ground. Who cared about it being too hot anyway? Soon autumn and winter would roll in, angry and fierce, the brisk wind howling in their faces, the cold biting at their skin, shards of ice stabbing their fingers and toes like tiny sharp swords. Then they would all complain about that too. Heather decided that sometimes grown-ups just enjoyed moaning. If it wasn't the cost of living, it was the drought. If it wasn't the drought, it was the heavy snow. And if it wasn't the heavy snow, it was the rain and badly behaved kids trampling on their front lawn, crushing their geraniums and dragging mud into the house. There was always something. A shadow passed overhead, a rush of birds clouding Heather's view. Bastard pigeons, that's what her mum and dad called them. Fucking shite hawks, she shouted it into the air clapping her hands before standing up and stamping her feet, the tarmac feeling like liquid under her summer sandals that slapped loosely against her heels, the straps frayed, the soles as thin as worn cotton. Heather Oswald, wash your mouth out with soap, you filthy child! The soft summer air felt warm and delicious on her tongue as she spun around and stuck it out at Renee Millward. She couldn't help but stare at Renee's huge pendulous breasts and broad hips. A swathe of pale green material clung to her bulges, accentuating her ample girth. You got a baby in there, then? Renee shook her head, ignoring Heather's acerbic remark and turned away, strands of damp hair breaking free from her hairband. Dark, wiry springs were laid flat against her forehead, shiny and wet, plastered down with tiny droplets of perspiration that sat in an arc around her hairline and ran down the side of her face. Always said no good would come of that kid, like mother, like daughter. Renee's voice rang out in the open air, her words directed at nobody in particular. Heather felt her stomach plummet a sharp pain sliding from left to right across her abdomen. She ignored Renée's comment, pretending that it didn't bother her. Words, that's all they were. Empty, meaningless words. Heather had learned to disregard them over the years, the malicious rounds of gossip that had been spread about the neighbour. How they were. Three words that had the power to cut her in two. They didn't. She had long since stopped taking notice of what anybody said about her and her family. She knew how to shake them off, those nasty words, and watch them glide away into the ether like liquid mercury. She also knew that Renee didn't have a baby in her belly. She was just fat. Even her arms were round and dimply, her fingers like stumpy little sausages. In truth, she really liked Renee and didn't know why she had just said that about her having a baby in her belly. Sometimes when Renee was in a good mood, she would give Heather a bag of sweets. Or if she was feeling really upbeat, she would throw in a bag of crisps and a can of fizzy pop. Here, she used to say as she shoved the goodies into Heather's hot little hands. Get these down, ya, and don't tell your mum or dad that I gave you them. It's just between us, yeah? Guilt stabbed at Heather's chest and tummy for being mean. Sometimes insults just fell from her lips. She visualised her mouth like a dumper truck, tipping out tons of gravel and spreading it out on the ground. All those rough stones and chippings making people fall and hurt themselves. That was her words. The stuff she said. Designed to maim. Used for maximum effect. She wanted to not say anything, to not spew out those insults, but just didn't know how. 
Maybe it was to stop their words. A way of getting in the first insult as a way of defending herself and her family. She looked up, an apology on her lips, twirling on her tongue like sticky candy floss. But Renee was nowhere to be seen. She had already bustled off somewhere, disappearing out of view. Leslie Harcourt was there, though standing on the other side of the road with her slick, clean hair and lilac ribbons, wearing long embroidered jeans and a tight-fitting T-shirt. She wore a bra as well. Eleven years old, and the first girl in class to wear one. Heather thought of her own flat chest, her narrow hips and unwashed clothes. Shame burned at her. A flamethrower under her skin, scoring at her bones. Leslie's dad had a job in town. He wore a posh suit, drove a car, and they went on holiday every year to somewhere that wasn't local. Not Scarborough or Filey or any of the other seaside towns along the northeast coast. They went to places that Heather could neither remember nor pronounce. Places she had never... Sometimes they would go on an aeroplane flying up amongst the pearl-white clouds like famous people with loads of money, while other families from around here were lucky if they managed a week in a caravan at Crimden Dean. Heather had never been away anywhere, not even Scarborough or Filey. Their family didn't go on holiday, ever. She didn't know why, just how it was. Actually, that was a lie. She did know why. It was because her mum and dad drank away any money that they had, but she was too wise to ever question it, to ask them to stop and use some of it to put aside for a week in a caravan somewhere, where there was a beach and a stretch of azure water that lapped around her ankles while she frolicked and played in it, eating ice cream and having the time of her life. A thrum pulsed at Heather's neck as she watched Leslie head over towards her, a swagger in her gait, and wearing lip gloss. Leslie Harcourt was wearing lip gloss, her mouth shining like buffed glass, her lips parted slightly in a half smile. What you up to? Nothing. Heather poked the drain cover with a stick before dropping the broken length of twig, aware of how immature she looked, aware of how immature her behaviour was. Suddenly, poise and grace felt important. Poking sticks into things was stupid and childish. Mouthing off to neighbours was uncouth and uncalled for. She needed to watch and learn to outgrow her embarrassing ways. Be more like Leslie. Less like herself and only speak when she has something interesting to say. When she got home... She would sneak into her mum's makeup bag, maybe steal some old mascara, a lipstick if she got lucky. Once her mum got off her face on gin, then nothing else mattered. She'd never notice. She would wake up the next day, hair matted to the side of her head, her face a funny pale grey colour, those small snake-like red veins spread over her cheeks. Her eyes would be glassy and unfocused for most of the morning until she'd had her cigarette and cup of tea and had brought herself round. It didn't bother Heather. It's just how it was in their house. She was used to it. Expected it. Anything different would scare her, make her think that something was wrong. Her family fraying at the seams was normal in her little world. She preferred the familiarity of it all the predictability of her mum and dad's behaviour, how they let her do whatever she wanted while they were busy. She could put up with the permanent hunger pangs and the cold in the winter when there wasn't enough money for coal for the fire. She didn't even mind the darkness when the electric got cut off because they didn't have any coins for the meter. But now she was in the presence of Leslie. Clothes and looking nice felt important. Essential. If the likes of Leslie Harcourt was going to be her friend, then she needed to improve how she looked, not be the scruffy, smelly kid from Tunstall Street. It was time to shed that particular look, be somebody different, somebody better, prettier.
if only she knew how or had the means to achieve it. You fancy a wander to the park? Heather's face heated up. Her fingers and toes tingled with anticipation. The park. She was about to spend the day at the park. With Leslie Harcourt. Forget the intense, unrelenting heat. Forget the greedy gremlins in her belly that leapt about and knocked against her ribcage. She had a new friend. A pretty, glamorous new pal. Things were looking up. Yeah, of course. Why not? She glanced away, her gaze fixed on the horizon, on the low, shimmering sun and slope of the nearby hills, hoping her laconic reply and cool, distant demeanour hid her true feelings. Being too eager was not the way to go. Leslie would see straight through it if she became too animated. Think her an idiot, not worthy of any attention. And she desperately wanted it. That attention was hungry for it, devouring every word, every look that Leslie threw her way. Her need to be needed was almost a physical thing, something that bulged beneath her bony frame and snaked through her veins. Great. Then afterwards we can go down to the stream, see if anyone's about. It felt as if somebody had lifted Heather up and was pulling her towards the sky. She was as light as air, giddy at the prospect of spending the day with Leslie, her latest new friend. Leslie's name floated around her head, rolled about her mouth, sliding over her tongue in a silent, swift movement, the feel of it a delicious, flavoursome thing, like raspberry ice cream and chocolate sauce, all rolled up into one big, gorgeous, gluttonous mess. Come on then, slow coach, what are you waiting for? And without turning to see if Heather was following, Leslie Harcourt, the sound of her footfall and the tinkling of her laughter, drowned out by the roar of passing traffic. Chapter Four I like the darkness. I like how it encroaches in barely discernible notches, shifting ever closer until it arrives suddenly, obliterating everything, shutting out the defects and flaws of the day. I love the anonymity of it. It allows us time and space to grieve over our mistakes and misfortunes. We can be alone with our thoughts and free up our emotions, not be forced to paste on a smile and go through the motions of polite conversation when everything around us is falling apart. The drive home is therapeutic, my mind raking over what just happened, how I reacted, what I saw and what I thought I saw, how rude I was to poor Alicia, turning and fleeing without giving her an explanation or an apology, without asking if she was okay and whether she was injured. My flesh puckers with shame, I make a mental note to call her later in the week, tell her how sorry I am, that I suddenly felt unwell and had to leave in a rush. I will tell her anything but the truth. That's because the truth is a slippery, evasive thing. It falls through my fingers like water, never staying long enough to fully implant itself in my brain. I'm not sure I would fully recognise the truth if it jumped up and hit me in the face. The fear I felt when I saw that note and read those words was very real, like being catapulted back in time. But then, like a thief in the night, it was snatched away and shredded before being thrown to the four winds. Much like the slip of paper that contained that blurry image, that too vanished. I should be used to it by now. My unreliable memory, the way things from the past dip in and out of my brain. Recent events stick. Every word in my books, every plot, every character, and their motives strongly rooted in my thoughts. But happenings and episodes from my past are harder to locate. Hiding somewhere in the recesses of my mind. Dark and secretive. Unreachable. I can't understand it. 
how that picture and those words disappeared, replaced with something drab and mundane, an everyday item, a receipt, a silly slip of a crumpled receipt from a local cafe. I did see it, didn't I? Those words? That pixel, and then they weren't. Here one minute, gone the next. I turn on the radio, the music lulling me into a near-hypnotic state, and try not to dwell on it, the fact that I'm fractured and faulty, my brain always letting me down, leaving me frightened and discombobulated. I sigh, place my hands tightly around the steering wheel and focus on the road ahead. I need to stop this going round in circles, torturing myself, trying to recall the past, convincing myself that I'm close to finding out who I was, only to suddenly discover that none of it is real, that I am using the lives and memories of others to fill the gaps in my own mind, inserting their thoughts and actions and tweaking them to fit the narrative I've constructed for my own life. Aside from my scars and memory loss, I'm a healthy individual, with a well-ordered, albeit lonely, life and a successful career. I'm single, have no children and no living relatives. I have a dog called Whiskey. I own some expensive pieces of artwork and antiques, a hobby I took up once my books started to sell. Yet I have no or few recollections of my early life or anything that came before the accident. Not an accident, actually. A hit and run. I was left for dead by the side of a country lane, my life hanging in the balance. Nobody was ever caught and held to account. With so few clues left at the scene, it's doubtful that the perpetrator will ever be found. That is my life. It's who I am now, not who I was. With no living relatives and neighbours or friends who know or ever knew anything about me, I am a mystery, a stranger in my own life, an enigma. And now here I am, doubting my own mind, what I saw, what I thought I saw. I'm tired. That's the only explanation for thinking that receipt was something other than what it really was. It was some type of hallucination, a dream. I've heard of it happening before. People who don't get enough sleep begin dreaming while they are awake. My sleeping pattern whilst getting my most recent book written, edited and published, has been scant and sporadic, snatching at naps here and there, getting up in the middle of the night to complete chapters and plug plot holes. I'm not thinking straight, imagining things that don't exist. The human brain is a complex structure and can often make us think we have seen things. Optical illusion. That's what that slip of paper was. A trick of the mind. An illusion. A cruel deception. I would very much like to know who I really am. I've thought about it a lot. I have scoured the internet and found nothing of note aside from my birth, which was registered on an ancestry site. I've written about it in my most recent book created a character who has lost their memory. I thought it would help, be cathartic and liberating, a way of dragging myself out of this pit of despair. I was wrong. It has had the opposite effect. It has made me unbalanced and exhausted. It has caused me to see things that aren't really there. The cottage is in darkness when I pull up outside. I turn off the radio, the crunch of tyres on gravel such a familiar sound to me. I barely hear it anymore, and yet tonight it feels heightened. A reminder that I'm alone in this place. With only my German shepherd, whiskey, for companionship. Tonight's solitude feels sharper than usual. A jagged blade in waiting. I know who you really are. Anger rises in my chest. I want to slap it all away, shut the image of that piece of paper out of my mind, shut the image of her out of my mind, pretend it never happened. 
that she didn't saunter up to me and make contact after watching me for so long now. I close my eyes and rest my head back on the headrest. It didn't happen. It can't have. There was no note, no words, no picture. I imagined it, all of it, I must have. And yet, it felt so real. The goosebumps that rose on my arms as I stared down at it. They were a tangible thing. Something physical that occurred. The note was not. It can't have been. But her? She was there. I'm sure of that part. Or at least I think I am. With the passing of time, it all feels skewed in my head, everything jumbled and blurry. A notion implants itself in my brain, a tiny pinprick of a thing that balloons until I can no longer ignore or dismiss it. What if there was a note, but it somehow fluttered under a desk, and the piece of paper that was handed to me belonged to somebody else? It's a plausible theory. More than plausible. It's a distinct possibility. Distinct enough to stop me thinking I'm losing my mind. I want to believe it, that somewhere under a desk in the library is an... I want to believe that it existed. Because if it does exist, then I'll know that I'm not losing my grip on reality. And that thought scares me more than she ever could. I open my eyes and sit up, then turn off the engine, squinting at my reflection in the rearview mirror. An old lady stares back at me, my scar a scarlet streak of lightning that slices across my features. Even the most carefully applied makeup fails to disguise it. If anything, it heightens it, makes it appear more pronounced, my flesh puckered and vivid. I know who you really are. Tomorrow morning, that piece of paper will get swept away by the cleaning team discarded and thrown in the bin. It will no longer exist, if indeed there ever was a piece of paper. I sigh out loud, a breath rattling in my chest. God, this is torture. I lean forward, resting my head on the steering wheel. If that woman does claim to know who I really am, then she is lying. It's impossible. Or highly improbable. How can she possibly know who I really am when even I don't know the answer to that? Or maybe I do. Maybe the thoughts I occasionally have are real. How would I know for sure? I climb out of the car and head into the cottage, drop my bags on the kitchen floor, switch on the lights and fill the kettle. I open the back door and watch Whiskey head outside into the darkness for his final pee of the night, his ageing stagger a sign that sometime in the near future he won't be around. Then I will know true loneliness. I shut out that thought, put it in a locked box in the farthest reaches of my brain. It's a dilemma for another time. I have enough to focus on at the minute, enough to keep me awake at night. That woman's face occupying my dreams. Outside, an owl hoots, its call ringing into the still of the evening. It's only 7pm and yet it feels like midnight. Not for the first time I question why I live where I do, why I bought such a remote property, tucked away in the woods, separate from the rest of civilization. I must have had a reason. According to the documents I have in the house, I bought it twenty years ago. It took me ten years to pay off the mortgage. It was fairly cheap when I bought it. At some point I redecorated, and, and then somebody ploughed into me with their vehicle and removed all that I knew from that time out of my head. When I came to in the hospital bed, my agent was sitting at my bedside. The police found her number in my purse and called her. No family, no close friends. An agent. Who am I? Those were my first words to her. And who are you? 
She explained that I had written a book and she had secured me a deal. The book was due to be published the following month. We could use your accident and memory loss to your advantage, she had said a few days later during one of her strained visits. Her head tilted to one side in faux sympathy as she eyed up the many tubes that were inserted into my body. It can be a hook to draw people in. Readers love to hear about the lives of authors. Any trauma can be used to help sell books. It's a story, a way of garnering sympathy and boosting sales. What do you think? Something inside me folded, my insides recoiling in resistance. Fear screeched through my veins. It felt like a bad idea, gruesome and unbecoming. I had no idea what it was, some deep-rooted visceral reaction to her words. I didn't want to be viewed in that way, my newly scarred face, my life on show to the public. So I refused. I didn't want to be viewed in any way. I just wanted to curl up and disappear. We parted company some months afterwards, our differences too great to ever be repaired. As much as I wanted to sell books and become successful, having my own personal suffering exposed to the waiting world and using it as a marketing tool felt like a step too far. I was already feeling fragile and vulnerable, my life stripped of its core, the very essence of me a deep hollow. With no memory, it felt like my insides had been scooped out and thrown away. I had to start again, relearn how to live my life, and with nobody around to guide me, it took a lot of time and effort. I knew then that I was alone. I also knew that the other me had possibly lived her life in complete anonymity for a reason. I just didn't know what that reason was. I had nothing to go on, nobody to ask. In all the time I have lived in this cottage since the accident last year, I haven't had a single visitor. No friends calling around for coffee. Not a single soul. Which makes me think that there is something in my past that is unpleasant, something I am hiding from. I make myself a cup of coffee and sit at the table, ruminating over the woman at the library and how her appearance has stirred up so many unwanted questions and thoughts. I should have followed her, asked what she wanted from me, and yet something stopped me. Some subconscious fear that had me rooted to the spot. What if a part of me does remember and I'm blocking it out? What if the note does exist and those words were some sort of threat? But then again, what if it doesn't and I'm losing my mind, slipping into the darkest of corners with nobody around to help me? My gaze roams around the room as if searching for answers. The bottle on the windowsill catches my eye. Even while I am sitting here, my hands firmly clasped around a mug of hot coffee, I can feel the shape of the glass against my palm, the smoothness and solidity of it. I can recall clearly how jarring it felt when I discovered it, a fleeting memory pinballing into my brain, making me feel breathless and frightened, and then leaving just as rapidly as if it had no right to be there. It had been a